Well, Malcolm, welcome to the podcast. It's a delight to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure to yeah. be here. So I'd love to start here. You have Mennonite roots. You live in sort of Amish or, or grew up in Amish country, as far as Ontario, Canada has Amish country. But you also grew up, if my research is right, in a Presbyterian church, which is actually my mm -hmm. original tribe. That's the denomination I grew up in. I'd love to know if we can start here. What have you learned? How have your Presbyterian and Mennonites roots roots shaped who you are and who you become? Oh, wow. Well, it was, so the, I grew up in Elmira, Ontario, which is Waterloo County, um, one of the kind of central Mennonites. You know, Mennonites are in Kansas, uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, Manitoba, and on Southwestern Ontario. So I'm one of the men in one of my, one of the men at hotbeds. Um, I would say you know the Presbyterian influence was a lot was marginal compared to the Mennonite influence, just because it was such an overwhelmingly Mennonite community. Um, so many of my friends and family's friends were really Mennonites, and then my parents moved um, from the Presbyterian Church to the Mennonite Church when wow. uh, when I was. Um, you know, th probably 25 years ago. So um, they kind of adopted Mennonite, you know, the Mennonite world and left the Presbyterian world behind. And I remember my dad, this sums up the difference. It was very, just after they had moved to this Mennonite church and there was a congregational meeting and he came back home and he said, the pastor sat uh, with the congregation in the pews during the meeting. And he didn't, he was so used to, in the Presbyterian tradition, the pastor would lead the congregational meeting. He was blown away by the idea that the leader would sit with the congregation and be one of them and listen to others, um, you know, run the show. He just thought that was the most beautiful and moving things. And I, I remember hearing that and thinking, you know, well, you're never going to go back to the Presbyterian Church. You've you've been captured <laughs> by hmm. you've been captured by the Mennonites. <laughs> What are what are some of those characteristics? Because you've written about it, you podcasted about the Mennonite community. I mean, it just keeps popping up in your material. So mm -hmm. when you think about, I like in the summer of 2022, you wrote that post about being at an Amish wedding, a Mennonite wedding, yeah. and how that moved you. So what are what are the principles or what are the ideas or the spiritual practices that have left a mark inside you? Well, one is, you know, that you mentioned this little post I wrote about, I went to the a wedding of the um, of uh, a, a young woman who I've known. She's the daughter of a very close friend of mine, um, and she's a, from a Mennonite family. Her father's a Mennonite uh, minister, and I wrote about how at the reception, the bride and the groom and all of their family put on aprons and they served food to the to the guests, the wedding guests. And I just thought that was first of all such a Mennonite move, um, <laughs> a kind of an expression of, you know, it's Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. I mean, it's such a kind of, but, it, you know, the Mennonites, for the Mennonites, that is a verse, that's a story from the Bible that has, that they've, you know, they've taken their, their, um, uh, their yellow Sharpies and they have underlined that, you know, there's a couple of very, very Mennonite sections of the Bible, that would be one of them. <laughs> and, you know, think hard about how to make that idea real in their lives um, I just thought it was incredibly beautiful. So there's that element that I, um, that was really that I, you know, the 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 idea that that um, uh, the humility that's associated and simplicity and lack of pretension that's associated with the way the Mennonites conduct themselves in the world, that was really really a huge part of what I absorbed from growing up in that world, um, and uh, has stayed with me. Um, another idea, and I deal with this, I have a bunch of, I have two episodes of this season of Revisionist History that deal with kind of Mennonite, directly or indirectly with Mennonite themes. And another is, um, you know, is there, is there pacifism and um, how that manifests itself? You know, the, so it's not a, it's, it takes a long, I, I think it's hard to explain to some people that pacifism is not a decision, is not indifference to the fate of your society or culture. Um, it's simply a choice to do your service in a different way. And that pacifism, in other words, um, incurs an obligation. 
um, it's not it's not the it's not the rejection of an obligation. It is the the replacement of one obligation with another. And the question is, what is the other obligation that you replace it with? And I was surrounded by people growing up who thought long and hard about what is our obligation to the world if we are not going to fight. Um, and they, the Mennonites are do a really, really good job of putting their um, um, their money and time and effort where their mouth is, right? They, um, you know, they're d- devoted to service, um, have extensive missions overseas, do all kinds of, and one of my podcasts is about sort of what that meant in the context of the Second World War. But that was also something that meant a lot to me. And more than that, I was impressed by growing up with with the kind of easy accommodation that the country, the, that Canadian society had made to Mennonites. The idea that, you know, we knew, and the old order Mennonites, you know, don't pay taxes. And the Mennonites as a whole, many of them, if Canada were to go to war, would not go to war. But the idea that that wasn't a cause of friction, it was just accepted that Canadian society was a place that was home to many different kind of cultures and ideas about. That That also, that was another thing that really kind of resonated with me that, you know, it's fine to accept people in all of their, um, in all of their different forms and you know, it's not. It shouldn't. It shouldn't discomfort us if some people choose not to um, express their commitment to a country in the same way that the rest of us do. You've had a, a little bit of a, a faith. Well, we all have a faith journey, but you've had a, a bit of a progression of your faith. So, you talk about being raised in a devout family. I think you know. You you said your brothers. You have a couple of brothers who are very serious about their Christian faith. Your sister's a pastor. Your parents took their faith seriously. Sister-in-law, pardon me. And then, you know, you kind of steer right politically as a young adult. I'd love to get in a little more of your career. But Mm. spiritually, it's been a real journey. And you wrote a piece for Relevant Magazine, I think this year in 2022, where you, you drifted away from the church and from faith when you moved to the U.S. and sort of your career started. And now... It's different for you. Mm-hmm. What, what's what's that journey been like, Malcolm? Well, I think it's about understanding that um, there are certain kinds of questions and problems that cannot be resolved in the absence of faith. Mm-hmm. I think that was the kind of that, um, and also it's in as equally to that, it is understanding coming to appreciate what is beautiful about faith. Those two ideas in tandem that um, you can't make sense of the world or fully find joy in the world, I think, if you are, if you've turned your back on that, on that aspect of spirituality. And it took, I think it just took a while, it took a long time to understand that, um, or to appreciate that. Um, And um, so that's really, I've given you a kind of, that's the sort of like, um, you know, the broadest outline of my journey is, is it just, I had these kinds of lessons that I've just talked about earlier mm-hmm. that I was aware of growing up, but um, making sense of them took a while. It took moving away and reflecting and the passage of 20 or 30 years. And then I'm, then I realized, oh, you know, that's actually, um, You know, when I was, if I'd gone to a wedding when I was 25 years old and the bride and the groom had put on aprons over their, um, over their wedding, uh, wedding wear (laughs) and were serving us food, I would have found that interesting and maybe a little bit funny and it wouldn't have, but wouldn't have registered with me. But now when that happens, it really, it moved me. Mm -hmm. Now I understood, oh, that's actually in this, in the context of the culture we live in. That is a beautiful statement, right? Mm. But it, it just takes a while sometimes for us to kind of grasp these these notions. Well, it's an interesting journey because, I mean, what a lot of leaders are dealing with right now in the church is a wave of deconversions. And, um, you know, there's a lot of problems with the church, a lot of problems with the church that we, we have to get serious about solving. Um, 
But, you know, your story is more of a reconversion story than a deconversion story, which is fascinating. Would you say, you know, as a young adult heading off to the U.S. and moving into journalism, et cetera, was that as much a rebellion or more of a drift? Or did you have an axe to grind with the church? Or when you look back on that period of your life, do you know what was underneath that sort of mm. distancing of yourself? Mm. I think, you know, it's funny. I... I had, when I lived in Washington, D.C. in the late 80s, early 90s, I um, used to go to a place called Washington Community Fellowship, which is a big evangelical church in in D.C. Um, uh, a guy named My- back then, a guy named Myron Osberger was the well-known, um, um, he sort of, he was a, he is himself a Mennonite, but he, he wasn't a Mennonite church. And that was sort of the, my first point of reconnection. I think it was more about the idea that there is no one size fits all with religious traditions. And I, I do think we need to, we shouldn't expect that the religious tradition, church tradition that we grew up with is the one that suits us. And I think that was another idea that took a little while to kind of figure out that there's, a, you know, there's, there's 20 different ways. There's a hundred different ways to approach these questions. And, um, you know, I don't think necessarily that the Presbyterian Church of my childhood was the right place for me. Ultimately, right. I don't even think it was the right place for my parents, which is no, no, not, I'm not dissing it. I'm just, it's just like a kind of, my parents properly belonged, I think, in a Mennonite. That was much more mm-hmm. in keeping with their, the people there were were much more similar to them in the way they looked at the world. But um, that, you know, it's funny, I did a, about four seasons ago, I did a, a um a series of podcasts on um how to think like a Jesuit. And mm. I tried to use um Jesuitical ideas to uh resolve certain kinds of problems. Um I was it was a, a series of podcasts on casuistry, you know, the central um Jesuit reasoning tool. And it was a really interesting process because in the course of doing that, I discovered something of extraordinary beauty in the Catholic tradition that I hadn't known was there. And it made me think, you know what, there's probably something like this in every tradition, and that we should be open to exploring that kind of thing. And we can construct our own um, uh, our own way of making sense of, of spirituality by this kind of, by engaging in that kind of curiosity about uh, what different traditions have to uh, teach us. You know, if you spend a lot of time hanging around Jesuits, you kind of get into Jesuits. I mean, they're like, they're, <laughs> they're something an interesting very, tribe. very, very interesting tribe. Yeah. There's, as they say, I was in Rome, I went to Rome and was chatting with some like very high up Jesuit in some, you know, 14th century thing in the middle. And he was like, as you know, as we say in our tradition, if you've met one Jesuit, you've met one Jesuit, <laughs> which I thought was kind of great. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, Ignatian spirituality, uh, the Jesuit. Mm-hmm. The reason I asked the Presbyterian question is there is an intellectual curiosity about you that I think is, you know, it, it just goes in so many different directions. And one of the things I've appreciated, even though I'm not affiliated with Presbyterians anymore, but when you look at the best of Presbyterianism, they're, they're the denomination or the tradition that remembers you can worship God with your mind as well as with your heart. Yeah. And I've always appreciated that. So I didn't know whether that was shaping or not. But. Yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, I, I know that when we were first going to that church as a young man, as a young kid, there was a, we had a, there was a really brilliant pastor at um, the first, it was the first time I, as a young, you know, this is when I was 10, it was the first time that I would listen to a sermon from beginning to end. I mean, that was a revelation to me that somebody could capture your interest for 25 minutes every Sunday. Um, you know, so that I'm sure that was a similar thing as a yeah. kid. Yeah, yeah, the sermons. I, I quit Sunday school for kids early so I could sit in the service and listen to the message, yeah. which, is, which is, I don't know, you know, what's behind that, but that's interesting. Well, thanks for sharing that. I want to talk a little bit about how you got to where you are in life too, in terms of career and calling and vocation and the things that you do. You had a pretty unlikely path. It it surprised me to learn. And again, you can read all kinds of things online, Uh, but you were hoping to start a career in advertising. Was that sort of the stated objective? And and if so, what happened? How did you get from Well, I didn't get a job. 
<laughs> so uh, I graduated from college in 1984, which in Canada was, you know, pretty bleak economic times. Um, so there weren't a lot of options. And I don't know how I got it in my head that I wanted to be in advertising. It sounded like a fun thing to be. And I applied to 25 places and got 25 rejections. So that was that. Um, and then I imagined, like everyone, I would go to law school or who, you know, I didn't, those were, I had all kinds of plan Bs. And then I, by chance, got this job for uh, $9,000 a year at a magazine in Bloomington, Indiana, and just took it. And that's, that was what got me in the journalism path. It was very serendipitous. Um, there was no, um, you know, I was as, as kind of aimless as, well, I wasn't aimless, but I, you know, I like to think actually that there is any number of things that either I or anyone could do that would you would find. We sometimes think, you know, that the profession we have is the only one that would have satisfied us. But in fact, I'm quite sure that if I'd gone to law school, I would have been perfectly happy being a lawyer. And I'm quite sure that if I'd gone to grad school, I would have been perfectly happy as a professor. Or if I'd gone to pharmacy school, I'd be perfectly happy as a pharmacist. I mean, I don't, I sort of think that, you know, we're much more kind of, um, uh, fungible in our um, in our joys as human beings than we than we imagine. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that's a really interesting thesis because you can get yourself into that little narrow pigeonhole. But how did uh, how did that job in Bloomington then evolve into books? And I mean, I'm aware you ended up at the Washington Post and then started writing for the New Yorker, et cetera, et cetera. But can you can you spell that out a little bit more? Yeah, I was working for the American Spectator in Bloomington, Indiana, which was a conservative monthly. And uh, it was actually really fun. I got fired after seven months. But in the seven months that I was there, it was enormously fun. And I started, they were very open to young people writing for them. And so I wrote, actually, my first article or second was about Chuck Colson. If you remember Chuck oh, yeah. Colson. Um, I do. I did a piece on Colson versus Falwell, which is, so this is 80... <laughs> Six, and I was talking about this divide between the evangelicals who wanted to get involved in politics and those who said it was a trap. And Colson was, of course, someone who thought it was a trap for the evangelical movement to become political. And Falwell felt the opposite. And so, yeah, I wrote that. I wrote a bunch of little. It just got me into the maybe aware of the fact that I that magazine writing or writing as it could wasn't necessarily plausible as a profession yet, but it was plausible as a vocation that you could, there were people who did that and they enjoyed themselves and they were places that would publish you. That's what I learned from that first job. And those were invaluable lessons. Um, what was they, your thesis <laughs> with uh, Falwell versus Coulson? I was on the side of Coulson. I don't, it's been so long. Since, I mean, I literally wrote this, you know, it's almost 40 years ago now. Um, I, I really liked Colson. I thought Colson, I found him, um, uh, he was, I found him, he, he was an extraordinarily sophisticated thinker, I thought. I thought, um, and I loved his story. I loved the, you know, he was in, he was President Nixon's hatchet man and then goes to prison and has a kind of conversion and um, becomes this kind of evangelical leader in America. Um I love that he devoted his life to prison ministry. I just thought there was every, everything, so much about him was so kind of curious and interesting. Um, and and Fowell, on the other hand, I never, even, it's funny, even then, I, I just didn't think it would end well if, 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 um, if evangelicals got too closely allied with a political movement. I just thought, regardless, at the time, of course, I agreed with Falwell's politics. I was a quite a you know I was a con, I was a conservative in those years. It wasn't that I disagreed with his politics. I just thought, why would you limit yourself like that? Hmm. Why do you really want to construct a world where someone who's not a Republican like you or has shares your Republican politics wouldn't feel welcome? That um, it just seemed like a limitation in a certain way. You know, it's not like it's not like Jesus said he only wanted to hang out with. Um, people of a particular religious stripe, you, you know, he wouldn't mm -hmm. limit. He, on the other hand, on the other hand, quite to the contrary, he was like he had the biggest open door policy out there. He was like, you know, 
come on in. Like, you know, I'll <laughs> hang with you. So it's just like, it seemed like an odd thing to me at the time. I mean, I was very unsophisticated. I was 22 years old when I'm writing this article. So that was just my feeling. And that, I have to say, mm-hmm. I I I I feel like I I I feel like I got it right in that instance um, back then. I did. I do think it was a mistake to so um, heavily um, get involved in politics. What I, I think your your point about Jesus is well taken. I mean, one of the disciples. This is almost never talked about. Was Simon the Zealot? There was Simon Peter, Simon the Zealot. The zealotry, from my understanding, was a political movement. It sought to overthrow the Roman government, et cetera. And Jesus was like, come on in. That's not what we're about. We're about this. And yeah. ushered in a different kingdom. What got you fired <laughs> after seven oh, months? Oh, it was um it was it wasn't it wasn't a firing in 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 anger. It was like, you don't belong here. I you know, I was I had difficulty waking up in the morning. You know, it's that kind of thing. I could get to <laughs> the office late. <laughs> but I think they recognized that I was unhappy in Bloomington, Indiana. And so I went to Washington, uh-huh. DC and had a better time of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, It seems to me, because you have maybe an entrepreneurial streak. You not only have a podcast, Revisionist History, but a couple of years into it, you co-found Pushkin Industries, like a whole podcast network, media company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Talk to us a little bit about, about that entrepreneurial streak. Because when I really looked at the magnitude of what you do, people people see you as an author. They see you as a writer of books and perhaps a podcast host. But if you scratch a little bit beneath the surface, and it doesn't take much, there's there seems to be quite a drive there too, Malcolm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I did start this company with my friend Jacob Weisberg. Um, we now have, I don't know, 60 some odd people working with us. Um, but I don't, you know, I'm... I'm the arm candy in the uh, relationship. I'm not. I'm not actually running the company or building it. Jacob is doing all that kind of work. I, I'm making stuff for the for the company. So, I'd be cautious a little bit about reading too much into that. But am I? Do I have? I like doing new things, and I like keeping moving. So, you know, I worked for the Washington Post for ten years, and then I was like, um, that's enough. And then I went to the New Yorker and worked for another 10 years. And I was like, you know what, that's enough. And then I wrote books for a while. And I was like, well, you, I don't want to write books forever. I mean, I want to do other things. You know, I sort of, I do think it's important um, that you're, you know, I feel like your, um, the freshness of your approach is not a function of your age. It's a function of how long you've been doing the thing that you're doing. Um, And that's an important distinction. Like there's no reason why a 65 year old can't be as, invigorated and creative and energetic of as a 25 year old but um the 65 year old has to actively seek out something new to um invigorate them that's the difference so i've always have felt that um the way to stay fresh is to keep moving what drives your curiosity I mean, you know, your your interests seem to range from war to success to underdogs to BMWs to Paul Simon to curating a book club to laundry. That was a fascinating episode. You made me completely think laundry, rethink laundry and how I do it, Mm -hmm. uh, to smoking cessation. I mean, that's a partial list. You have this omnivorous range of interests. What what drives that? Because that doesn't seem to be abating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what does drive that? I don't know. I like explaining things, and I like um, telling stories. I don't really mind where the story comes from. Um, Hmm. And I like, uh, I get, you know, somebody sent me a little um, series of interviews uh, today, 50 interviews they had done about a documentary they were doing on Tom Bradley, former mayor of L.A., of Los Angeles, first black mayor of Los Angeles, um, who I'm very interested in at the moment. I'm thinking about writing about, or I am writing about Tom Bradley. And I was reading through some of the transcripts of these interviews. And it was like, it was, it's hard to describe the kind of, kind of pleasure that I get from that. Like there was an interview. So one of the guys, Tom Bradley is, comes out of South Los Angeles at a time where there are no there are no black people in public life in Los Angeles. The power structure of the of the African American community in LA is 
is the, is really the church. And the dominant guy in the black church in L.A. in those years is a guy named H.H. H. Brookins. And H.H. H. Brookins takes a shine to young Tom Bradley, right? So I've been struggling to find any kind of interview, something with H.H. H. Brookins. He's this mystical figure who everyone talks about, but there's just nothing out there. So one of the, I'm looking down the list of this interviews people, these guys did, they all, they're all done from 20 years ago. And I see H.H. H. Brookins and I think, oh my God. So I read, <laughs> start reading over lunch, this interview with H.H. H. Brookins and it's just magical. It's like, he's come alive again. This guy who's been dead, he's been dead for, since, I don't know, he died in 2008. And he's suddenly speaking to me, you know, it's like <laughs> telling me about how he, He's like, at one point, he's like talking about how you give sermons. He's like, the first half, I talk about Tom Bradley. The second half, I talk about Jesus. And I was like, wow, there we go. Now it's all starting to make sense. You know what I mean? But it's that mm. feeling of that idea that you can discover. It's a little piece in my understanding and ultimately of the reader or the listener's understanding of Tom Bradley. It was I got a little piece right there, you know, it goes into the puzzle. Um, Tom Brookins decided Tom Bradley was going to be, you know, his guy. And that made all the difference in the world. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just find that, I find that exciting, that moment. But even exciting. into Cars, like your your episode, it was on someone else's podcast about your love of cars, BMWs, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Often, I think, I think what's curious to me about it is sometimes someone is intellectually curious. So I'm just very interested in history, very interested in current events. But like, yeah, I don't even know the name of the car I drive, that kind of thing. But you know exactly the kind of car you drive. Do <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, Ta- yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about your passion for cars? What's the story behind that? Well, I've always that? had it. I had it as a kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, like every five-year-old, I got obsessed with cars. It's just I never stopped. And ah. so I spend an enormous amount of time thinking about cars on car websites, selling cars, buying cars, you know, enjoying cars, looking at cars. I don't know. It's just like a, it's just like a part of my, there's a whole side of my social life that's essentially people who have lots of cars or love cars and who want to text with me about cars. I, it's sort of, um, uh, I can't explain it. I just like, I have the same feeling about construction sites. It literally is, I have a six-year-old side of my brain, which never shut down, which likes those kinds of, uh, you know, dump trucks, construction sites, sports cars. <laughs> That's all. Construction sites. Just like yeah, I love what, them office too. towers, yeah. cars. Doesn't matter. Doesn't all, matter. All of the above. I st- on my way to work, I drive by this building that's being massive old buildings being renovated. And I almost slow almost to a stop just to see what they've done over the previous 24 hours. <laughs> you know, it, it, there, there's something underneath this I want to explore for a second, which is a lot of leaders I talked to, I had a burnout period in my life uh, years ago. And so, you know, on a regular basis, sometimes almost daily, I'm talking to leaders who are burning out. One of the questions is always, do you have a hobby? I didn't until I burned out. Now I do, not at the level of probably buying and selling cars and slowing down at construction sites. But, you know, I boat, I learn to grill, et cetera. Do mm. you see, when you think about your rhythms, your disciplines, your habits, the curiosities outside of work help drive the continued passion for your work, if that makes sense? In other words, the cars, the construction, and and yeah. you're passionate about running as well, yeah. um, you know, and have been your whole life. Do you see a connection between the two? I do very much. So yeah, um, and I, I did a in this episode, this season of revisionist history. I have an episode about this. Will link up to your question. Um, it's about refugees, and I tell a story of how my parents back in the seventies got together with a group of their friends and sponsored three Vietnamese re- refugees, and then I tell a story of my brother, who's a was an elementary school principal about how he had all these refugees in his school. Um, and one of the points of the podcast is that, you know, my brother's attitude toward refugees was shaped by unconsciously, unconscious, excuse me, unconsciously, I'm quite sure, by my parents' attitude towards refugees. And my point is that being kind to strangers is a habit it's a contagious habit. It's something, it's something you have to practice. 
if you want it to be. Um, and I always think that that's why, for example, there's so much talk in the Bible about kindness. Um, because it's you have to keep doing it if you're going to do it. You you can forget how to do it. It's it's a muscle you've got to exercise. And I think of all of, there's so many things which people think of as traits, and I would say they're not traits, they're habits. So hmm. you could say, when people say that curiosity is a trait, what they mean is that kid was born curious. Well, actually, I don't believe that. I believe it's a habit. I mean, what I believe is that that's someone who practices being curious. And the more they practice, the better they get at it. The way that the more you, it's like saying playing the piano is a trait. No, it's not. It's a habit. <laughs> you, you know, you're not born being able to play the piano. You're, you have to learn it. And then you have to keep doing it if you're going to be any good at it. You, kindness is that. You might have a predilection towards it, but you've got to practice it if you're going to be any good at it. Hmm. And curiosity, all these kinds of things. So what habits are, what, 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 what hobbies are, um, in part, they are ways in which we practice um, ways of dealing with the world that can be very useful outside of it. And a hobby is a kind of thing that you pursue in the interest of, um, it's a way of finding joy in some um, relatively prosaic activity. That's the point of a, of a, of a hobby, right? It's like, I'm going to do something that, I'm going to find a way to turn this into an enjoyable activity. Um, and that's an insanely important habit. That's like you're practicing being happy. It's what, it's what happiness <laughs> is, right? I have never heard a hobby defined that way. And uh, I'm going to play that back and commit that to memory because I think that's exactly what it is. It is a way of finding joy in something, whether you're doing woodworking or cars or you know, even studying construction or barbecue, that's something that I really enjoy doing, cooking for other people, grilling for other people, et cetera. Yeah. It's interesting that your family, because we grew up about two hours from each other, hour and a half from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in Midland, Ontario, basement of our house, 1979. We oh, really? bring in Vietnamese refugees. My oh, parents so we have Christians. Comment. Yeah, seriously. Like oh my, my goodness, bedroom was over so here, their bedroom was over there. And that really shaped things. Uh -huh. It was it was a movement, I think, uh -huh. in in the Canada of the seventies. Had that must have left an impression with you to be sharing your home with people from around the world, or you 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 would have still been home at that time, would you? Yeah. Not so they were. Yeah. They would come over. So they weren't living. They were our our refugees were old enough that they could. We got them in a apartment in town in Elmira, uh -huh. but they would come over all the time for meals, but. My speaking of habits, my parents had a habit of bringing in people for meals. So my dad had graduate students from all over the world, and they were constantly showing up. They would show up like clockwork on Saturday nights and Friday nights, and we would just feed them for years. I mean, my, you know, it was just like normal that you would have like two Indian guys and like someone from Africa would show up at five o'clock on a Saturday, and they would just have dinner with us, and then they would, and then we would sometimes go to their house. I ate, I'd eaten more curry. By the time, serious curry by the time I was like 12 than most kids in Southern Ontario. Um, <laughs> and the reason my parents did that is that some people had done that for them when they were, my mom was an overseas student who goes to, to school in university in London. And, and that's how she got by. People invited them into her into their home when she was, my dad's parents would do this. It's like this intergenerational so it's just a kind of habit of mind. So the, the, and this is a lot of what the podcast I did on this was about, which was, it wasn't a big deal for us because it was no different from what my, it was just a version of what my parents had been doing. And there, some, many of their friends have been doing for years already, just not on this kind of geopolitical stage, but opening your home to people, to others and sharing and offering kindness. It's just a kind of, that's just how you rolled. Um, and, uh, it never had a name, I think, until, or a kind of cause attached to it until 79. But what happens in 79 for Canada is so interesting. You know this, many people listening may not. Canada is now, it's between Canada and Australia, 
both on a per capita and in many ways on an absolute basis, lets in more refugees than any other country in the world. Um, it's now a national habit. Yeah. So yeah, we started is. practicing in 79 and we never stopped practicing. We did it with Syrians, did it with the Afghanis, with Afghanis and we did it with, you know, we did it through the, it's just like, that is uh, the Vietnamese in 79. That's another version of what we're talking about. The country just got, if you look at, at the, um, someone was showing me the kind of public opinion polling in Canada for support of refugee resettlement and the number of Canadians who say they would happily sponsor a refugee if given the opportunity, the numbers are off the charts. And it, that's not because Canadians are better people than anywhere else. It's just that it's a habit. We've been practicing. Mm. So it's, you know, we used to. That'll be on, on season seven, right? Uh, yeah. Your team, is, your team sent me advanced episodes and yeah. that one hadn't been produced by the time that's we right. recorded coming it. Out. Season seven is is launched uh, this this uh, in June, so it's ongoing. But that's episode six. It's, it's about okay, refugees. Great. Yeah. Well, I'll look forward to it. The, the The rest of the season that that I got in pre production was fascinating. Yeah. Just really, really great stuff. I wanna you're also reimagining how podcast or how uh, audiobooks are done. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued when talking to strangers came out. It was just such a fantastic audiobook. I read The Bomber Mafia last summer when it came out and kind of wish I'd listened to the audiobook. One of those things where I'm sure that would have been really fascinating and probably will mm. at some point. But um, your Paul Simon book was fascinating, where my wife and I are halfway through it. And it's almost like Netflix. If I skip ahead, I'll be accused of adultery. So I have to wait until she's in the car to yeah. finish it. But it's fascinating. Like You're just an extended conversation mashup with Paul Simon. Um, tell us about your passion behind audiobooks and what you're thinking about, you know, even further reinvention of. Yeah, it's just, that's very simple. I mean, it's an obvious idea that why, if you're going, if people are going to, lots of people now want to listen to books because it's easier, it fits with their lifestyle better right. than reading them. And why would you, if that's the case, and they're willing to commit to six hours or whatever, of why are you just going to sit in a sound booth and read the book to them? Why don't you, why not, you know, why not make it into an audio documentary? Why not, if, if you're talking about, you know, Paul Simon and you tape the interview, just play the interview, right? Like, why, why are you reading, like, you know, or if you're talking about, in the Bomber Mafia, you're talking about, you know, flying a B-17 bomber. Let's hear the bomber. Let's yeah. hear the sound of the bombs falling. Let's hear, let's hear, you're talking about, you know, FDR giving a fireside chat. Well, let's hear FDR give the fireside chat. There's tape of that. I mean, so it's just yeah. a kind of very common sense notion that um, if you're going to commit to telling a story through audio, then go all the way. Like make it an, an experience that people will will want to join you on. So that's a lot of what Pushkin is about, is about that, is we started this company so that we could improve the overall quality of, of kind of, um, of, 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 of audio, of what was available in audio. Yeah. Anything else you're working on that you're really excited about right now in terms of reinventing a format, reinventing audio or a particular project while we're on this subject? Well, there's, there's, uh, no, I mean, there's just the, just the podcast and the, uh, the current book I'm writing, this sort of, um, this Tom Bradley project, and I'm still kind of puzzling through that. Um, but I'm, you know, the Tom Bradley, the problem, which is such an interesting one, but I don't know how to, I haven't quite figured out how I want to approach it, but it is, it is this question of, um, so here is a, black man in, 19, in the 1960s in Los Angeles, in a city that is mm, where, the, where the black, the African-American community is never more than 15%. He wants to be mayor. In order to be mayor, he must accommodate the interests of the white majority, right? And yet he is a member of a very distinct, embattled community, black community. How does he square those two obligations? Right, to his own people and to the people he needs to attract. That problem, which has been, you know, has versions of that have been um, played out a million times over history. Um, I really want to, I find that fascinating. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's even, there's, you know, there's obviously the, the point in, remember when 
in the Bible when Jesus is asked, when he takes out the coin and says, who's on the back of the coin, right? It's the same, you know, it's that same thing. What do you owe to Jesus and what do you owe to Caesar? Um, True. It's, you know, it's like, that's a kind of really, really fascinating question. And then um, I'm looking for a way to kind of explore that in a creative way um, and the kind of compromises that that um, choice uh, um, necessitates. For your writing process, you're in the middle of a book right now. I believe you said, and again, feel free to correct this. This is just research for the interview, that you start in the middle and you're not exactly sure where a book ends before you begin. You just kind of start, you do your research, and then it takes on a life of itself. What is the, first of all, is that reasonably accurate? And secondly, what does a writing process look like for you, Malcolm? Yeah, that's reasonably accurate. I tend to kind of start with some kernel that I think is interesting and can go in lots of different places. Um, the writing process, I mean, writing, you know, uh, actual writing takes up a very small amount of time. It's all of the stuff around the writing. It takes a long time. The research, setting up the research, uh, the, re the rewriting, the editing, the kind of mulling over what you're going to do. So a lot of it is, and I have less time now than I used to, so I've had to kind of get more efficient at all those tasks. But um, uh, so there's very little, you know, the the people's, um, you know, fantasy about writers is that we go off in a cabin and for six months and, you know, sit down at the typewriter every morning. That just never happens. Uh, it's more like you have an hour and a half in the morning where you, think about it and work on a little section of a chapter and then you come back to it two days later when you have another hour and a half. Um, mm -hmm. It's very kind of fragmented. And like I said, it's the other stuff that takes all the time. The um, the amount of logistics that's of, involved in writing nonfiction is enormous. Finding things, reading them, thinking about them, interpreting them, thinking about where they fit, you know. Um, well, and you do a lot of interviews, you do a lot of travel. I mean, talking to strangers, you're recording a conversation in a cafe on your iPhone. You listen back mm. to that. Um, a lot of it is is very research based. What um, what are, what are your like? Give us a typical day or week in the life of Malcolm Gladwell right now. What are you spending your time yeah. on? What do your rhythms and disciplines look like? Yeah. Well, this week uh, I spent some time rewriting the final, um, uh, I had to do a final set of revisions on the last podcast episode of the season, which is about mm. story of a guy named Lester Glick, a Mennonite, of course, um, who's involved in this strange experiment in the Second World War. He's a group of conscientious objectors who, um, who volunteer to be guinea pigs in a medical experiment at the University of Minnesota. And it changes him it's an experiment where he, um, and I do three episodes on this, it's called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment, and they agree to be starved, to be, to undergo six months of profound malnourishment so that scientists can understand what happens to people who are malnourished and how to nurse them back to health, which everyone knew was going to be one of the central problems coming out of the war, right? Mm -hmm. Millions of people in Europe and across Asia who are, in a state of profound um, undernourishment, what, how do we help them? And we had no idea. Do, what do yeah. you feed them? How quickly do you feed them? Can they can they recover? Do you are, are protein is protein more important than carbohydrate? I mean, on and on and on. So he's part of a group that wow. served as this, and so he he's been long dead. But I interviewed his children, and it was all about um, how did that experience? He suffered, as all they all did. All the guinea pigs did. How does that suffering change the rest of his life? So once the experiment was over, and the answer is it changed it profoundly. He, on the one hand, had an eating disorder for the rest of his life. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, he did, it, it, it strengthened his determination, um, his motivation that he should spend his life, broadly speaking, bringing sustenance to those who were malnourished, which he interpreted as spiritual sustenance. And he became a, he went around the country planting schools of social work and helping people, um, also feeding people. He actually 
he used to make f- huge amounts of cinnamon buns and give them out. I mean, he was this, he was profoundly changed and in some ways distorted by this experience, but in a way that was actually beautiful. Huh. And anyway, so making this, it's a very tricky thing to bring this guy to life and to explain, particularly to people in 2022, why, why this guy's name was Lester Glick, why Lester Glick would have said the way that he suffered and the way his life was distorted as a result of his participation in this experiment was a good thing. Mm. And that for someone of his kind of religious faith, suffering in the name of some broader cause is not some weird kind of unthinkable thing. It's a normal thing, right? That It's funny. It's like, it's, and I'm trying to explain, I both have to explain how ideas about suffering that are held by someone who is not just a devout Christian, but a devout Christian of that particular variety Mm -hmm. um, are different. And also ideas about suffering in the middle part of the 20th century are different than now. Now we don't, now we're allergic to suffering in all its forms and we don't (laughs) understand that it can have. um, Anyway, so I spent one day, Monday, I spent rewriting that thing. And then Tuesday, uh, did I do an interview? I think I might have done a, oh, I'm trying to arrange this interview with somebody. Do you know the writer Gary Wills? He's a, I jazz, don't know. he was a Catholic, no. um, trained as a, uh, and then he became a, it was a big deal kind of journalist and religious writer in the 70s and 80s. I and mean, he wrote a book, which I f- discovered randomly in a hotel room. It's a long story. Read, thought was amazing. He's now well into his 90s. I've been emailing, got his email from his daughter, and I've been trying to get him to talk to me about this book, which is insanely <laughs> interesting. So that was a you know big project done. And then I did, uh, I'm trying to promote the season of revisionist history, and then I came in and I recorded the episode I was rewriting. And then, you know, it's sort of like a rhythm of uh, some, it's this mix of research, doing, promoting the shows that I've done, and then working on the next thing. And then I was talking to these documentary filmmakers in LA who have this, um, they're the ones who have all this Tom Bradley material. And I was trying to um, see if they would, if I could, if I could uh, join forces with them. And so it's just a mix, it's a different, you know, every day there'll be 10 different things that I'm trying to go through and check off. How do you, how do you do your running in the midst of all that? I take it you're still an avid runner? Are you? I am. I'm injured at the moment, but I ah. I try and carve out some time at the end of the day. And what well, the great thing about running is it's not golf. Like golf is, you know, to be an avid golfer is inconsistent with any kind of legitimate human activity. You're <laughs> it's three hours a day, right? It's like how do you do anything else? Like you uh-huh. you then you got to drive there and like you know by the time you're done, it wipes out an entire afternoon. But running, you know, you can very efficiently run for forty five minutes and be fine. So it's actually the best possible sport for someone like me to be involved in if you're busy. Um, and But this morning I got up and did, went to the gym. At, so I got it out of the way then. But I, I can squeeze it in if I'm, it just means I have to, um, uh, you know, the long, slow workout has been replaced by the short, intense workout. And then any other personal disciplines, rhythms, anything from bedtime to diet or anything else that's really helping you stay fit, alert, and curious at, you know, 30 years into a career, 35 Mm. years into a career? Uh, I do think, you know, one of the things I try and do is um, listen, be expose myself to things I disagree with. which I think is a really useful um, exercise that, uh, and because very often what you discover is that you disagree with it less than you had thought you did. So one of the things I did yesterday on my lunch hour was I read the Dobbs decision, the Supreme Court decision on abortion. Um, read most of it, it's quite long. I skipped over the super legal parts. Um, it was super interesting. Do I know why I think about it yet? No, uh, I have some thoughts, some little bits of it that stuck with me. Um, but it's just very useful to like, because you can't get a flavor. You're reading, it's 200 pages. So you're reading in the mm. newspaper 
someone else's approximation of what was said um, filtered through that person's set of interests, biases, what have you. So you're not really getting it. And I think you sort of have to get it. And it allows you to evaluate the responses, right? It sort of sense, okay, so d does this support, should I be angry? Should I be hysterical? Should I be fearful? Should I be happy? Should I be, you know what I mean? Like you can't really decide mm -hmm, unless mm -hmm. you, so I read that. It was super interesting to read it um, and to kind of like mull over and to see the way everyone sort of on the court. The court is such a bizarre institution <laughs> that, <laughs> that I, I've never, as a Canadian, I can't wrap my mind around the idea that you have all these people who are there for life. It's so weird that they're there for life. Like whose idea was that? It just seems strange. Why wouldn't they be there for 10 years? And then they sit down, you know, there's no other institution. It would be like, you. what would happen if every church said that the minister was there for life? Or every, oh, yeah. or your your doctor said, I'm your GP and I'm going to be your GP for life. Like, it's just sort of weird, <laughs> isn't it? Like, it is kind of I weird. I don't get yeah. why they're there for life. But um, that, that's, a, that's a thing aside. But anyway, I just think it's a useful, there should be, you have to be moments in your life where you, you do, um, uh, where you, where you, uh, get you, you you force yourself to access things that are outside your normal, you know, um, range of interests because it really does broaden your perspective. That's a great discipline. Well, we have a few minutes left, Malcolm. I I like to ask this question of different leaders. We've had uh, your friends from Next Big Idea Club on the podcast before: oh, Adam yeah. Grant, Susan Cain, Daniel Pink, etc. And uh, We've had different people weigh in on this, but we do. You do have tens of thousands of church leaders listening right now. If you could give advice to church leaders in this moment, what is there a particular piece of advice you'd like to give to church leaders? Huh. Um, that's interesting. Um, I mean, one thing is, you know, the um, one thing I've noticed just within my own family, you know, the, or, or circle of friends the impact of COVID on the church um, is really dramatic, that you have a community that is based around, you know, in its simplest form, social communion, and you shatter the communion. You, you know, everyone's stuck in their homes, and you break the habit of coming together on Sunday morning. And that's, that's actually really significant. And um, I'm very strong of a the, of the view that we're doing way too many things online and not enough things in person these days. But I really feel that about any kind of uh, spiritual gathering um, needs to be in person. And to to have gone for three years where that was impossible in many cases is really, 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 really hard. Um, and I worry a lot about the recovery of that and trying to build those habits back up again. Um, and... Uh, I guess the other thing, the um, I you know I think it's already happening in some sense that I've been really intrigued in looking at my watching my mother for example, and seeing how the her kind of spiritual focus over the years has moved from the general congregation to small group work mm -hmm. and realizing how crucial those small groups have become almost to the point where they they don't supplant the institutional church but they they're certainly a kind of um, really really powerful parallel force, and at her stage of life, a more important force. I mean, that's really what she's where her spiritual life is. It's in her small group. Um, that's super interesting, and I I think of that even beyond churches. That that idea that there is something about a group of ten twelve people um, that is incredibly powerful, and you know the army realizes that. Um, and True. many churches realize that. But I'm wondering in the rest of society whether we shouldn't come to a broader appreciation of there's some magic there. Um, and maybe that's the op there's something op socially optimal about the small group that should be exploited in many other um, domains, that that's a way to, to sort of um, uh, to uh, pull off this... Uh, this this combination of a group that's large enough that you can find inspiration um, and support, but small enough that it, 
it's intimate, right? That is a sort of balance of those two things. And that's, that's the sweet spot for human beings. Um, so I think, I guess I would say that the pursuit of those, that kind of small group magic um, uh, uh, is a kind of really f- fruitful avenue but I, uh, for, for, um, uh, for the world of churches. Last question, Malcolm, because we're coming up on time, but is there a subject or an area of life that you would love to pursue that you've never pursued or a question you wish somebody asked you that nobody ever asked you? Like, is there some yeah. unexplored vista that you're like, oh, yes, I wish we could go here? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's tons. Um, uh, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. I write sometimes about science and medicine. I don't know enough to know what I don't know. I don't know enough to know what I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, you know, I wish, I wish I had the leisure to kind of explore. I don't know much about statistics, and I feel like so much of, uh, of, of understanding the world now is requires some kind of depth and appreciation of, uh, of data. On the one hand, the other thing I would say is, um, I only know one language, which profoundly limits my ability to kind of uh, appreciate and learn from other cultures, which I think is a real um, weak spot in the way in which I appreciate the world. Hmm. It's good to know our limits, isn't it? Wow. Well, Malcolm, um, the new season of Revisionist History, by the time this airs at the end of July, will be available pretty much everywhere. And uh, if there's another call to action you would have for our audience or a place you'd like to direct them, where would you like to to send our audience? Oh, if you go to um, to our the Pushkin website, uh, pushkin.fm, um, you can find all of our various audiobook offerings and all the cool things we've been up to. Great. Malcolm, you've been so generous with your time and also with your insights. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Carrie. That was really fun. Thanks so much for watching the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, do so. Share it with a friend and leave us a comment. And I've got two things I want you to do before you sign off today. Number one, if you're a church leader, would love for you to go out and visit hegetsuspartners.com slash Carrie. Click on the link because here's what's happening. There's a $100 million campaign going on, basically sharing the gospel with the world. And if you become a partner for the He Gets Us campaign, here's what happens. People who are interested and respond to the ad get connected to your church. It's an opportunity for you to enter into dialogue, have a conversation with them, people who are really authentically exploring Christianity. So go to hegetsuspartners.com slash carry. And also, if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, make sure you do so. The Art of Leadership Academy has over 150 high quality, done for you resources for you and your team. Whether you're leading a church or whether you're leading a small business, you're an entrepreneur, it's done for you. I will train you in communication. I'll train you in team leadership. I'll train you in so many different things. We have PDFs, videos, downloads, cheat sheets, you name it, we've got it. It's ready to go. But it's beyond that. The Academy is also a community. I do live monthly coaching calls. We have an incredible community involved in daily dialogue. It is troll free and Um, It's available for a very low membership fee every single year. Would love for you to check it out. Make sure you check out theartofleadershipacademy.com. Click the link and we'll see you inside there because here's why I started it. I graduated law school. Nobody taught me how to run a law firm. I graduated seminary and nobody showed me how to run a church. Had to figure it all out. So that's why we created the Art of Leadership Academy. It'll help you lead and help you thrive as you do it. Thanks so much for watching the podcast. We'll catch you next time. And I hope our time together today has helped you thrive in life and leadership.